Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Carnell. I'm the director of the Biological and Physical Sciences Division at NASA headquarters, and Peggy's been involved in doing that early stage type of research throughout her um, very long career at NASA. I don't know of any other astronaut that has spanned so many different platforms and vehicles. I think you've been on shuttle, Soyuz, you've been to station, now you are heading up and spearheading the new commercial space station with Axiom and leading the astronaut group there. So, um, and you've had what, something like 675 hours in space? Days. Days, I'm sorry, not hours, days. <laughs> 675 days of yeah. your life in yeah. space. I mean, yeah. that's unbelievable. It's very um, special experience to be able to, to do that, spend that much time up there. Uh, you know, we talked about it being a unique environment to do all this research in, but it's a really unique environment to try and learn to live in because it is so different from everything you're used to on the ground. Your bag doesn't sit on the floor. You don't sit in a chair. Your pen will float <laughs> away if I let go. My microphone would float away. All of that is completely different. And to have an opportunity to spend that much time becomes a second home, and you learn to live in a completely different environment. So, so what made you decide that you wanted to go into space and be an astronaut? All right, that dates me. All right, uh, when I was nine, <laughs> wow. I saw the first guys walk on the moon. Neil and Buzz uh, took their first steps on the moon, and I thought, wow, I want to be an astronaut. I was a farm kid in Iowa, uh, and of course, there were no females astronauts at the time, uh, and I had no idea how to become an astronaut. It's not like you could Google back then. <laughs> and <laughs> so I had no idea what it would take, but I knew they were all pilots, and so, you know, the next year I had an opportunity to go for a flight in a small private plane with my dad. He, in a Cessna 150, took a flight in a plane, kind of kept the dream alive. I started selling chickens at $3 a piece. That's a lot to get my pilot's license in a lot of years. <laughs> but uh, when I graduated high school, it was the first year they picked female astronauts. And I always say that was the time that my dream became an, a real goal because it seemed possible then. Luckily, I had no idea how hard it would be <laughs> because it still took 10 years of applying after um, I got my PhD in biochemistry before I was selected to fly in space. Well, that's so interesting that you're from Iowa and off the farm, so am I. Oh. Very, very unique. Um, well, what was your favorite experience in space flight? What do you like the most up oh, there? Yeah. I, I love really the experience of being there, like I said, in that whole different environment. You can't beat spacewalks, but being a scientist, I loved all the science. Uh, I mentioned to Lisa this morning that it's, it was really neat over the course of my career. My first flight was in 2002 with NASA, and my last flight was 2016, 17. And uh, the quality and the caliber of the science that we were doing had just exponentially grown. Um, and to me, that was really exciting, to be a part of that. Um, as, an, as an investigator myself, I was doing renal stone studies uh, because of the increased bone remineralization, more calcium in the urine and phosphates, and so we were looking at renal stones. But, so I'd been through that whole process, the years of, of um, doing all the uh, proposals, getting the approvals, you know, getting NASA to agree to how we should do this, and all that was, it was, you know, five years, and luckily by then I was selected to be an astronaut. <laughs> so I was my subject for my own experiment, but <laughs> someone else had to run it <laughs> because I wasn't available at the time. But um, anyway, uh, just being, doing the investigations and being the hands of the people, knowing how much time it takes to get to the fruition of doing your experiment in space is very satisfying to me. Uh, it does put a little pressure on. Just a little <laughs> bit, I would say. So can you tell us a little bit about that cell culture experience that you had and um, what is your stem cell experience that you've done up in space flight so far? So I've done uh, cardiac stem cells. I've done various different types of um, stem cells where we're looking at proliferation of different 
stem cell types, mesenchymal versus uh, other types. And uh, it was really interesting on that study. I was using these, uh, it's a modified six well plate thing where you have individual ports for each one to feed and, and provide. Uh, in that case, we were just feeding them through these ports. And I, you know, was very, you know, kind of, I'm a scientist, I know how to do sterile technique, and I you know, thought, hey, I'm really good at this, and I got the tray out the first, after the first feeding, and I'm like, oh my god, I contaminated one of these wells. It was, it was like furry, you know, look, I was like, oh my god, contaminated I something. Before myself. I, I was like devastated, and I pulled out another plate, and I'm like, oh no, another one's contaminated, and they said, which well is it? It was the same well, and it was the same uh, type of cell, and it had proliferated so quickly that it looked contaminated. It was, you know, and it co conglomerated together and formed, you know, basically something that looked like a contamination in the cell culture thing. But it was just pretty amazing to me because I was like devastated. Ah, so much for sterile technique, you know. <laughs> but okay, so I mean, thinking about that and sterile technique, and you know, trying to manipulate in the space flight environment, even just feeding your cells, isn't that hard? I mean, how do you do that? Well, it, it, we require any type of fluidics uh, in space is going to be different because uh, the air bubbles get to be a lot more problem uh, problematic, and so you have to do things to try and minimize bubbles and. Um, and doing media exchanges is challenging because of, of the fact you're dealing with fluids. Um, I uh, I like to I enjoy doing it. I you know it just requires some precision in how you're handling things. Uh, but uh, I enjoy it. I thought it was interesting how you were describing the way you would tilt the plate a little bit, and you know, kind of you had to come up with unique ways to actually do that manipulation and kind of invent it yourself, right? A lot of the things we did, I was working with uh, another company, BioServe. I know they've done some things, I think, with CAT before. And they were, uh, you know, I helped develop the procedures on the first time we were doing these stem cells on the ground because I did have enough in the laboratory experience and I had enough in-flight experience to be able to say, okay, this will work, this won't, we need to try this. It, I mean, it was simple things like, you know, they're like, okay, we're going to put the Ziploc bag up here and you're going to put trash in it. I'm like, that's hard to do in the glove box. I'm like, let's just put it here and I'll shove it up. It's going to stay. Zero gravity. You know, just little things like that, you know, that, you know, you don't necessarily think about. Um, but I was able to help them develop the techniques, you know, putting Velcro on the bottom of the little caps. You partially unscrew it so you could keep it sterile. And then you would use the whole syringe, unscrew it off, leaving the cap stuck to the Velcro. And then you could attach to a sterile sterilized port and just little things like that to develop that that process to make it sure that we kept our cells sterile that's taken your experiments to a whole new level right um, <laughs> so so they ask you i know that at least nasa does and i'm sure now that you're with axiom you have to do so many experiments you're always multitasking how do you do that, all, all the multitasking experiments that they ask yeah. of you, aside from fixing the space station? <laughs> well, the, the variety of different things that you do in space actually appeals to me. I like doing a lot of different things. Um, so, but it is hard when you have like a full day's worth of timeline, timeline down to the 15 minute blocks of you've got to do this, 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 and then get all these things done. We call it chasing the red line because the red line moves whether or not you're getting the task done. And so everybody's always kind of chasing the line, trying to keep up with it uh, to get all the different tasks done during the day. So there's a lot of pressure for the timeline. I like the diversity. Uh, it just means you have to maybe do a little extra planning the night before, get a few things pre-positioned so you'll be fast and ready to go. Uh, but I, I like the diversity. And you, and you work with the scientists on the ground, right? You have direct feed with them, and they, you know, you kind of iterate back and forth. I do like those investigations where there is a lot of interaction with the scientists. Uh, we, we heard, I don't remember who said it today. I wonder why that happened. It's always interesting when you have an experiment, and you're like, and the investigators are like, uh, that doesn't happen on Earth. <laughs> and I was doing one where I was doing colloidal suspension of iron molecules and electromagnetic fields. And uh, the pr procedure called for me to set it at 
20 hertz for the electromagnetic field. Well, you know, your eyes get a little affected in space, so you don't see quite as well, and it was 2.0 instead of 20. <laughs> and, I, and they found a whole different result. You know, normally you increase the electric field and it forms a solid. And then when I did it at two, it formed a waveform. And, they, you know, they're like, that doesn't happen on Earth. <laughs> so it's just interesting that the things that the investigators can find out and being a part of that interactive process is a lot of fun. So then we, after we finished the planned 20 hertz investigations, we repeated the whole thing with two hertz. <laughs> That's amazing. And some of the best discoveries are through those types of accidents in the lab, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, what is one of the most, well, the most nerve-wracking aspect of space? Is it getting there, getting back, trying to get yeah. those PI experiments done? In my experience, uh, my uh, most nerve-wracking time was uh, when uh, the shuttle was docked to the space station. I was uh, the commander, my first time commander. I was been a commander for all those 30 days. And we were redeploying a solar array in its final position at the very end of the port truss, which is the truss is. Uh, a football field long, and these arrays that we're deploying are 115 feet each. And as we were redeploying one array, it started to tear, so we stopped it, the deploy. But that meant we had to fix the tear we, because we couldn't let the shuttle undock with a partially deployed array. And if the only way we could either not deploy it, we knew we weren't going to get it back in the blanket box because you can fit 115 feet in a blanket box like this because it's paper thin and folded back on itself. And there's no way with this big tear five feet long that was going to fit back in the box. Um, so we knew we had to either get it extended or dis, uh, just jettison it, which would have meant then we couldn't add the next module, which was the next shuttle was bringing up. So that was a very stressful time for me, figuring that all out. Um, but I think that's one of the best things about NASA is being able to problem solve. And I think it's a great lesson learned for any team uh, that you, know, you can solve impossible problems uh, by going after it and just taking everybody's input, getting as many and as diverse a group uh, as possible together to provide that input. Because a young engineer came into the mission control room on the ground and said, hey, why don't we just make cufflinks to span the tear? And uh, so then, in orbit, you know, we don't have any spare cufflinks that are four feet long. <laughs> so I had to make them, cutting them out of metal and punching holes and, you know, doing all the clamping for this. And I made all those, and then we had to jury rig some of the sportiest robotics ever, where we used the station robotic arm attached to a shuttle inspection arm and got a crew member who was the tallest guy, too tall was his call sign, and we got him out there at the end and told him to lean, because he was as far close as we could get him to it. <laughs> and he was able to put those cufflinks in, and we were able to deploy the solar array, and by the end of the day, we had 97% power. That's impressive. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> way, to, way to MacGyver it, right? Yes, it was. <laughs> Definitely MacGyver. <laughs> so, you know, in the last panel, they were talking a little bit. Somebody raised the issue, or the, not issue, but the idea of bringing back the payload specialists, um, something that um, my division's been working and, and looking into. And, you know, you've also been kind of helping to shepherd all of these new private astronauts as they come mm -hmm. through. So, um, you know, Rihanna was a scientist from a country. She had no previous space experience at all. So how do you not only select, but like, but train these types of scientists that are, you know, coming to spaceflight, working with you, that just have no idea what they're doing? <laughs> Well, I, we uh, did help uh, Axiom Space was involved in the selection process with the uh, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and selecting their two astronauts. Um, and uh, I thought Rayana would be a great fit uh, because I knew that they wanted to do some life sciences research and she had all that background in the glove box and uh, doing tissue culture uh, for breast cancer uh, research and I, I thought she'd be a great fit. Um, and uh, then we just went through the training process. And, you know, it's just, I think having somebody, especially for her, it was, you know, if 
I'm, I keep telling her, if I can do this, you can do this. You can learn this. You can learn how to do this. <laughs> you know, I and that. I think it was just really helpful for her. Uh, I love that. And, and hopefully, you know, we were fortunate enough to have you around to help train future payload specialists, especially yeah. with the patients that you're talking about. Um, you know, so we're here for this um, for this actual symposium, they've been talking a lot about therapeutics for cancer, mm -hmm. you know, different types of diseases. So um, are there any technologies or therapeutics that you think could be um, uniquely developed or, or discovered using the microgravity environment um, that may be related to stem cell aging, cancer, or precancer? Well, uh, I think uh, Kat has kind of hinted about in numerous ways that uh, some processes are actually accelerated in space. Like, for instance, the bone demineralization process in human beings can be uh, greatly accelerated. An osteoporotic woman here on the ground can lose about 1% of her bone mass in a year. In space, if we didn't do anything about it, we would lose 1% a month. And so it's a great model system. It's not great for the astronauts, but <laughs> we have to do two hours of, re of exercise every day. But <laughs> it's gr a great model system for looking at drugs uh, involved in uh, trying to reduce demineralization or looking at procedures to increase uh, bone uh, recalcification in break broken uh, limbs, like we had broken hind limbs in some uh, rodent studies, um, looking at different drugs to try and help stimulate that, different matrices so you can use the, 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 the that accelerated effect to try and examine your drug procedure or whatever in that in that particular case so it just depends the a lot of the cancer cells tend to grow more like they do uh, in the human body uh, and also very quickly and so again cancer treatments I've done antibody conjugated drug treatments um, and and uh, different studies like what uh, Kate, uh, Kat just described, uh, it's, it's really important to be able to use that accelerated model to really test out things very quickly. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of that kind of research. I think uh, there's gonna be lots of things that we don't necessarily know now that we're gonna find as we go along that different things are accelerated, but it'll help us use that as a model system. Then there's just some procedures that, you know, things, you can form perfect lenses in space because there's no gravity. So different things like that are gonna be helpful or be something that you could potentially manufacture in space one day. And so I think there's a lot of potential out there. Yeah, I know for many years they were doing a lot of that crystalline research because you can grow mm -hmm. them more perfect in space, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, and then taking on to something Elaine said earlier, talking about AI. Yeah. So you know, over the next day, decade, how do you see AI and automated systems um, supporting space and spaceflight research? Well, uh, from a life sciences perspective, uh, I feel like how can you know everything about all the proteomics, uh, all the different omics that are out there now. AI could be a great way to help the scientists in space figure out the next steps of what needs to be tested or what, what might be valuable in testing on orbit. Yeah, thanks, and, and I do think that that's emerging and we are gonna see a lot more of that. Um, you know, and, and one topic that's really um, near and dear to my heart are the tissue chips that were brought up. And, you know, we have been exploring, especially as we look to lunar and Mars destinations, you know, what's going to happen to the crew and, you know, how can we create, you know, a personalized medical kit for them. And so we've been exploring the concept of developing these tissue chips out of the astronauts themselves that are flying and being a an astronaut yourself, how would you feel about that, having your um, cells used to create these tissue chips and then I, having them I go think, with you? I think it'd be great. Um, I, I feel like in, sometimes we don't personalize medicine quite enough, and in that case, there is, when you have such a small number of people that are being exposed, you don't know how to predict. And having you know your personalized medicine with you and you know, on a much more accelerated scale, uh, be able to predict problems or issues that might be coming up, I think is a great idea. 
Yeah, you know, and I, I've read studies before. I'm, obviously, I have no experience, but they, you know, where they were talking about how like the pharmacokinetics and dynamics are very different yeah. in spaceflight. Have yeah. you yourself oh, yeah. experienced that? Yeah, uh, drugs don't have, and it's partly, you know, partly a GI thing uh, where drugs don't have the same absorption and the same pharmacokinetic activity. Uh, uh, it's not just absorption, but their actual uh, efficacy is decreased mm -hmm. in space. And so we have to use different uh, drugs, sometimes like for motion sickness, um, you have to use other alternative means rather than using the gut. Uh, because that's not necessarily the best way to get drugs in. Yeah, I think that's interesting, and I think that's where these tissue chips can play a really important role, especially as we go on, you know, the long duration Mars missions. We can't take everything with us, so we really need to hone in to keep the crew protected. Um, and then, you know, another area that's really um, been emerging for, at least for our division, is the scientist astronaut concept and doing much more rapid space science research. And I would love to know what your thoughts are. So having kind of that, bringing back that payload specialist concept of having the um, researcher or the scientist actually go to space flight and iterate just like they would on the ground. And I know mm -hmm. that's a whole new world. So what are yeah, your Yeah, but thoughts? I think with Axiom Space, it would that is uh, one of the things we would offer is these increased opportunities for access for different organizations, whether it's commercial or universities, um, other countries that have never flown before. It's this increased access on all levels. And so that is an opportunity that is going to be uh, provided by Axiom Space. And that, that's their whole model is based on that. Oh, I think that's wonderful. And I think having, you know, SpaceX and some of these emerging space companies, you know, being able to provide that access much more rapidly is going to make all the difference. Um, you know, so now you were talking about Axiom and we have the Leo economy that we're all looking towards. I mean, so where do you see some of the biggest um, some of the biggest wins for that Leo economy for Axiom or any of the space companies moving forward? Well, being a life scientist and that, having my background in that area, I have a little more knowledge in that area. I see pharmaceuticals as being a, an easy target uh, to have access. But uh, a lot of the drug research um, for you know, therapeutics or, um, you know, prevention even, I think uh, definitely have, have potential uh, to be developed in space or at least to determine efficacy uh, in space for certain types of things. So uh, I think that is probably a number one thing. Also, the protein crystallization offers up uh, another avenue for pharmaceutical companies to, to jump in and get a head start by having better x-ray crystallography pictures of what's happening uh, in the particular proteins of interest. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a great resource. But I've done research in everything, you know, I would say superconductors to soybeans. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> it's it's a, a pretty diverse uh, you know, field, you know, lots of areas of physical science uh, or uh, the life sciences, I think, are, has a huge potential in the future. You know, um, and that's where I do, I do see this huge benefit, not just for NASA to accelerate our research by, you know, having the scientist astronaut in the loop or just increasing the pace, but even for you in the LEO economy, you know, right now, which you've experienced, <laughs> you know, send a, send a sample up and then you do the research. Maybe you can walk us through one of those experiments to, just so everyone gets an idea. Well, I, I think what's really important about where we are in the space industry right now that, you know, we talked a lot about inflection points, but what's really important is, you know, NASA is planning these missions to the moon. But they're not going by themselves. It's going to be a, a group of government agencies, but it's also going to be commercial entities as well. Already, Axiom yeah. Space is developing the spacesuit that will be used by those astronauts on the lunar surface. Um, SpaceX is designing a lunar lander. Yep. Um, so it's going to be all these efforts in the future are going to be much more integrated. And the model for how we do space flight and do space industry is going to change, I think, based on a lot of these collaborations that we're seeing expand right now. 
Yes, so speaking of you know, the lunar vicinity, whether it's Gateway or the surface or Mars, you know, any desire to go out to that lunar vicinity? In a heartbeat. <laughs> we'll take you. <laughs> Good deal. No, it's, um, you know, it's very exciting. We actually have those Artemis missions coming up very soon. Yeah, it is going to be exciting. So, yeah. And, and I'm looking forward to getting in the uh, Axiom suit and helping, helping the folks that are designing that. Yeah, I can't wait to see. I know that we got a preview of it, but they they aren't um, green anymore, are they? Was it green or it was, black? It was black. Yeah, no, they are not thermal. No. They would just look cool. It's, yeah. <laughs> For the review, that's, that's kind of what I heard. But they, they've changed a little bit now, right? No, yeah, well, the the main color will be white. It has to be for thermal regulation. Yeah, but, uh, I have, are we're going to have some, you know, sexy blue and orange. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We've, I mean, space is already cool, but they're just kind of up in the ante here with all these, like, neat outfits. Yeah, so, so as you look forward to, you know, like, some of the next steps, do you have any um, burning, um, passionate ideas that you want to complete you know, before your career ends? Oh, uh, there's a lot of them. It's a long list. Oh, so. I love that. <laughs> yeah, well, I would love to help you complete those <laughs> yeah, and no. get that checklist off. We're, we're definitely, uh, you know, I, I'm excited working at Axiom Space. I, I didn't know when I left NASA that if I would ever have an opportunity to fly in space again. And so it's just been really exciting for me to not only have the opportunity to fly in space, but to be a part of the future, helping the folks that are designing the mm -hmm. Axiom station, and now the Axiom suit. Um, all of that is really special, a special way to uh, continue my experience base. I love it. And, you know, NASA is going through this huge transition because the International Space Station, the life of that is supposed to be ending in 2030, and we'll be transitioning over to these commercial platforms. So we have to work hand in hand with, you know, all of these commercial providers. And, you know, in thinking of that, you know, would love to be exploring different avenues of you know, activities that we could be doing with you sooner than later. But one thing I'm really curious about too, you know, you've, you have had, you know, you've been so fortunate to touch so many aspects of NASA and now in the commercial world. What, how different is it in the commercial sector compared to when you were a NASA astronaut? Uh, it's, it feels pretty different. Um, I think the, there's definitely a, big push for the innovation it's you know that's what commercialization does for us it really forces that uh, innovation factor mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's uh, incredibly important to expanding our reach in space and expanding our capabilities in space um, I think NASA's role is just as it always was been very important for us but I think the adaptability of all of us together, coming up with these new um, regimes of how we're going to do spaceflight in the future, is really important because it's an, an it's an expensive endeavor, but it's mm -hmm. one that actually has tons of benefits uh, for us here on Earth. I agree with you, and you know, kind of. To that point, you know, circling back, it, it's very expensive, and I can even say from the NASA side, it's a little bit scary, or maybe a lot scary, you know, this whole new world that we're looking at, and how do we transition to a new environment, but, you know, coming back around to that benefit to humanity, and also all of the research that we need to do to protect the astronauts, you know, there's, it's just invaluable. So I think, you know, hand in hand with you guys being able to explore cancer therapeutics as we move forward, being able to, you know, address NASA's needs and, you know, address the, the general population on how we can look at disease modeling. All of those are going to be really critical. It's like a step function change, right? Going to space, yeah. taking a I look at so. things. Yeah. I, you know, I, I really, um, wanted to share with you the, the fact that the perspective of uh, Earth from space is amazing. Uh, you, you look down at the Earth and you see this incredible planet. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. And you realize all of humanity, except for the half a dozen dudes that are up there with you, live down there, as far as we know. <laughs> Everybody lives there. And, and there's just this thin, brilliant 
blue line that you see at the edge, and it, that's our atmosphere. And you're like, oh my gosh, that is so thin. <laughs> and we've got to take care of that. And then you see this structure that we're building up here, and you realize, hey, we're trying to you know, produce the oxygen, remove the carbon dioxide, take the water out of the air, make sure it's, you know, mm -hmm. protect ourselves from a temperature standpoint, you know, that minus 270 to plus 270 degree change. Mm -hmm. All of that is provided by this planet. And, and we have a magnetosphere that protects us from radiation, largely. And so that I like to think of Earth as spaceship Earth, because we're all in this planet together. We're all traveling through space together. And uh, we have to take care of, of our planet and that perspective. But what's really then to take and look out to the stars when you're on the eclipse side, and you're in this shadow, you see thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of stars. And it's, it's overwhelming. And then you're like, and we're just one galaxy. There's billions and billions and billions of galaxies. You know, we're not even a speck of sand in the beach of the cosmos. And it's just this perspective that you feel and for how special this one place is that we live on uh, becomes even more uh, valuable. And that there has got to be other life out there, and we need to go find it. That's, a, that's absolutely amazing. And I would have to agree with that. It's, it's hard to imagine that we're the only life form in the universe. Yeah. But, but we won't go into UFOs and aliens right now. <laughs> um, although we did stand up in office. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, so all this is just really, really neat but just something a little more fun. What's some, what is there something on station and you know, when you've been in space light or maybe some of the other um, vehicles that you've been on, that's like your least favorite thing? Was it like eating or just, you know, what, what are some of the, the least favorite things going to space? A uh, flush toilet would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some interesting <laughs> stories on all of that. <laughs> so, it, uh, you know, you learn to deal with it. So, you know, it works, but it's not the, you know, the most comfortable or, you know, there's things float in space. <laughs> You know, you, you don't want to have to deal with that. Okay, and let's all go have some dinner now. <laughs> but but um, no, I love that. That's that's that isn't what I expected, but that's great. <laughs> no, I mean I've just heard so many stories, you know, about the food too, and not being able to taste, or you know, like maybe somebody wants mac and cheese every day because there's nothing else that they like when they go. What was your favorite food in space? My favorite food was chicken fajitas. Yeah, really? yeah, but it's all about the sauce, you know. Yeah, hot you, sauce. Yeah, yeah, to have a hot sauce. We had all kinds of sauces because the bone demineralization process causes uh, high salt content causes um, an increased rate of bone demineralization. So we have to reduce the salt content in the food, and therefore it's a little less palatable. And so you need to add other things to it to make it more interesting. So you know what sounds kind of fun, and Jana, maybe we can bring you in on this. So don't they have those contests at like these Buffalo Wild Wings places? Like whoever, <laughs> you know, you can get the Guinness Book of World Records for eating the hottest spice because yeah. isn't it something that, you know, I you can't taste I, the spice as much? Or it's yeah, when you're in hot. space, yeah, when it doesn't taste as spicy. Okay, maybe we can put mm -hmm. that on your docket next time you go. On, on, as an you'll experiment? Have more, you'll have more than one record. Surely, surely can't you know. can come up with a better experiment than that. Cat and I can come up with a lot of really good ones for you, and we were cooking that up earlier too, but <laughs> no pun intended. But you know, that, you know, as we look forward to the future, you know, long duration missions, and you know, they've been talking about um, 3D printing of parts, 3D printing of materials, mm -hmm. or. 3D printing of food. Were you up there when they printed pizza, I think it was? No, I didn't print pizza. I printed various little tools and oh, you other, did? other things okay. on, on orbit. It, and they, we were looking at different types of plastics and materials to use, which ones printed better and which ones stuck to the printing plate. Uh, you know, so we had to figure out some of the best combinations to use in space. 
but it is cool to actually print something that you you um, yes. need uh, because uh, when I was in, on my first flight, I lost a teeny tiny little Allen wrench, oh, teeny goodness. teeny tiny one you know, using your computers. And, you know, I looked and looked and looked and, you know, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And then the, so I had them send up another one on the next arriving shuttle. Uh, the day after the shuttle arrived, I found it on the vent. I'm like, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the way things always work? You know? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, and then just kind of bringing this all the way back around because, you know, we are here, um, you know, for this stem cell summit and the research. You know, I know that you and I were talking earlier about, you know, what, how, what could we do, you know, to iterate in space flight? And, you know, can we culture the cells? Can we take them from frozen and literally pipette them? Do it sure. at a level that, you know, is conducive to that pharmaceutical environment. And so, um, you know, I, I guess one of the things I was wondering is, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that's really feasible? I do. I think we'll have to develop some special uh, techniques for fluid handling, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I totally think it's possible. Uh, the surface uh, cohesion mm -hmm. of liquids actually helps you a lot with a lot of different, um, you know, some of the wells on the plates. As long as the plate size isn't too big, the well size isn't mm -hmm. too big, uh, things will stay down in the bottom of the wells pretty well. Um, and so we just need to work on techniques that, c that can use the surface tension as our uh, assist mm -hmm. rather than as a deterrent. Yeah, I think that's really neat. And, you know, I guess one thing I was thinking about and something that we can all work together, uh, my NASA folks here and hardware providers, commercials, that, you know, having all of the tools and the capabilities up there, because I think you were describing to me that you know, you don't even get to look at the data from the fluorescent microscope. Is that right? Yeah, unfortunately not. It was, uh, didn't, they didn't let me see that one. I don't yeah. know why. Yeah, how, that's so sad. That it was is like sad. my favorite. That was my favorite thing in grad school. It felt like Christmas. You know, yeah, get, to get to look at to the get fluorescent microscope. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. When I was doing the uh, colloidal suspension, it was uh, during Expedition Five, and at that time we didn't have much calm. And so we were, because we were flying in unusual orientations, and um, so it wasn't the comm wasn't designed to work that way. So I'm like, uh, leave leave it up on the display so that I can watch the experiment. It'll be like my TV. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's taking gaming to a new level. I just won't. <laughs> watching your colloids all day long. <laughs> That's awesome. But you know, even just you know, getting those um, sort of. Uh, thank you. Getting those sort of, um, you know, the data, being able to see that in real time. So, you know, perhaps that's something we can work towards having a microplate reader or other different types of hardware, you know, that could be just COTS adapted. So, you know. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the technology is moving that way. We did, for instance, uh, Kate had done, Kate Rubens had done the first DNA sequencing on mm -hmm. orbit. And then I took that to the next step by, um, sampling and growing uh, microorganism and then sampling that and actually sequencing it to determine what the microorganism was. Uh, so we took it start oh, to cool. finish and, and then we sent all the stuff to the ground so they could verify our results and it was good. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm so jealous, but um, it's been an absolute pleasure and just amazing to even be here and an honor to be in your presence. You know, I have to say, I went down to get coffee and she was in the lobby and I just stood there like, you know, a five-year-old, you know, looking at, <laughs> looking at your Marvel superhero Iron, Iron Man or something like, wow, don't you all know who she is? Oh my goodness. Um, but this was an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you, Thank Lisa. you so much. And Great questions. You know, I'll be honest. Um, I would love to see, like, we need to have a, our commercial astronaut on one of our lunar missions. So, you know, uh, I'm I in. think I'm in. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think we should push for that. <laughs> All right. Thank and you. And I'll do stem cell research while I'm there, okay? Yeah, that's, oh, <laughs> and we're going to have chips made out of her, too, so we're covering all bases. Okay. But thank you. And, all right. And thank you again, Peggy. Thank you.